Welcome, willing workers, to another study in the book of Luke, as we have been doing the past two quarters. And uh, I'll go ahead and get right into our lesson for today. Uh, hopefully you have uh, been getting the necessary emails to uh, update your prayer list and pray for these people of our class and their friends and relatives. The title of our lesson today is called Willing, and our our lesson is taken from Luke chapter 22, verses 39 to 53. I've added a couple of verses to what the uh, study actually calls for. Our theme throughout this lesson is Jesus willingly submitted to God the Father's redemptive plan. Let me go ahead and read the verses for today, and then we'll get into some comments. Uh, starting in verse 39, Luke writes, And Jesus came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place to pray, he said to Peter, James, and John, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And Jesus withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to Jesus an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. <clears throat> and Jesus said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. While Jesus was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to the man, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when the disciples who were around Jesus saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And Peter struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Now, before we get into the actual uh, comments on the verses, here's an introduction that takes us to it. You know, we we all know life can be hard. We've experienced hard times ourselves throughout our entire lives. And even when we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, uh, things like pressures on our jobs when we had a job, uh, health issues, which all of us are dealing with currently, and family relationships can make our lives a real challenge. Even representing Christ in this world can be a very difficult challenge when we are moved out of our comfort zones. 
In each of these situations, we are called to trust God, knowing God has his plan and he is working it. He does not have a plan B. He's had a plan all along since before he created the first molecule of this universe. In today's lesson, we see Jesus express trust in God the Father while carrying out God's redemptive plan. Now, these events followed the Lord's Supper, which Jesus instituted the night before, and they seem to speed up as the plans of God are set in motion to move Jesus toward the crucifixion on the cross. Jesus led the disciples to a familiar place to pray and to prepare for what he himself would face. Luke provides the most concise account of Jesus' prayer and his arrest. The Gospels of Matthew and Mark locate these happenings in the Garden of Gethsemane, which was located at the base of the Mount of Olives at the beginnings of the Kidron Valley. The word Gethsemane means oil press. So Mount of Olives used to be an olive grove, and at the base of it, where Gethsemane was located, was an oil press to press the olives and get the oil that people used from it. Uh, if we read our scripture today alongside the other gospel accounts of this same incident, the intensity of the moment is increased exponentially. Mark reports that Jesus was distressed. Matthew highlights Jesus' sorrow. Both of those Gospels reveal that Jesus was deeply troubled during this time. Jesus even told his disciples that he was sorrowful even to the point of death. Through all of this, Jesus ultimately and willingly submitted to God the Father's redemptive plan. Now, in several places throughout the book of Luke, Jesus provided the disciples instructions on how to pray. Here, we see Jesus, we, uh, we see Jesus modeling prayer in a very powerful way. While making his request to God the Father, he ultimately submitted himself to God's will. While making his request, Jesus exemplified how he instructed the disciples to pray. Remember, Jesus told them, Your will, O Father, be done. Jesus asked God the Father for strength to face his coming death, which would institute the new covenant. I reminded you last week that at the institution of the Lord's Supper, the church of Jesus Christ was born that night. And uh, by his blood shed on the cross at Calvary, uh, the new covenant has been instituted. Now, uh, let's move on now and look at uh, comments about the verses that we've already read. Luke writes of Jesus leading his disciples to the Mount of Olives. Matthew and Mark both write that the location is a garden in the Kidron Valley at the foot of the Mount of Olives. Luke noted in his comment, in his uh, writing, that this was a usual place for Jesus uh, to go alone and pray and to take his disciples and have a little retreat from the crowds there. 
mentioning that Jesus led his disciples to this place underscores the discipleship pattern of following Jesus in the spiritual disciplines. In this passage, Jesus taught the disciples how to pray under the weight of severe testing, which Jesus warned that each of the disciples would encounter in their life here on earth. Jesus instructed believers to align themselves with God and with his will. In Luke 22:40, Jesus instructed his disciples to pray lest they enter into temptation, which is the last petition of the Lord's Prayer. Jesus commanded in chapter 21 his disciples to keep alert in prayer so that they may be strong enough to flee the things that were about to take place because Jesus' cup of substitutionary suffering and death would not be removed by God the Father. Jesus would drink this cup. He would die, but death would not have the last word. Jesus withdrew or pulled away from the other disciples. His withdrawal communicated the emotional weight of the situation at hand. Jesus was alone by himself. Luke not only recorded the distance, but also recorded Jesus' posture. Remember, Luke said he was a stone's throw away, and Jesus knelt down to pray. Kneeling is an act of humility, and it is different from the ancient Jewish custom of standing with outstretched arms much like the Pharisee in the parable in Luke chapter 18, praying at the temple. <coughs> now at this point, we see Jesus' mood as he prayed. At the beginning of his prayer, he prefaced his request with the words, Father, if you are willing. This reveals that the events that were about to take place were part of God's plan. Jesus did not concern himself with if, ands, or buts about the situation, but he willingly submitted to the will of God the Father. The word translated in Eng into English, nevertheless, demonstrates that God's will must come to pass. And Jesus, again, willingly submitted himself to that course of events. Jesus prayed, remove this cup from me. Now, in the Old Testament, the cup of wrath was a common metaphor. <coughs> While Jesus made the desire of his heart known to God the Father, his primary concern, again, was to do the Father's will. This is an important lesson for all believers. We must admit that prayer does not make our will known to God because God knows everything. He knows before we even ask. But prayer often makes God's will known to us. Those who submit themselves to God in prayer open themselves up to being used by God even in suffering. Jesus' request is less significant than his desire to do God's will. In other words, Jesus said, if, it, if you're willing, Father, take this cup from me, nevertheless... Not my will, but yours be done. 
Now an angel at this point from heaven attended to Jesus to strengthen him for what was ahead in the next few hours. An angelic manifestation following prayer had also happened during Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. You remember that story. It's uh, found in Matthew chapter 4. In both of these cases, the angel's appearance strengthened our Lord Jesus for the mission that he came to seek and to save the lost. The angel ministered to Jesus in a time of anguish at this time. And this anguish was so intense that Jesus' sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The descriptive terms that Luke used to describe Jesus' fervent prayer and his emotional anguish highlight the intensity of the moment. This is a picture of tension and readiness for the battle ahead. Jesus rose from prayer, ready to accomplish the task that was set before him. While Jesus was being strengthened in prayer, unfortunately, the disciples were sleeping. Now, it had undoubtedly been a long day, and the emotional weight the disciples had upon them uh, up through the Lord's Supper had tired them out. But faithfulness requires intentional diligence. Jesus was prepared for what lay ahead. The disciples were not. This emphasizes the nature of of Jesus' battle against the forces of sin and death that no other person can face with any kind of confidence. Jesus did what we cannot do for ourselves. He awakened the fear-paralyzed sleeping disciples, asked why they were sleeping, and warned them to pray so that they would not enter into temptation. While Jesus was still speaking to the disciples, Judas and the mob showed up to begin the sequence of events that ultimately led to the very battle for which Jesus is now prepared. Judas stepped out of the shadows as one who would betray Jesus. Even though Judas acted as money carrier for the disciples, he was known among them as a Scrooge and as a thief. Uh, <clears throat> Judas was present at the Last Supper, I think we all remember that, during which Jesus predicted his betrayal. The price of the betrayal was 30 pieces of silver. Judas, the money handler, had handed Jesus over to the authorities for the price of 30 pieces of silver. I want to bring your attention to Genesis and the story of Joseph. And uh, in that story, we are told that Joseph was sold by his brothers to slave traders for 30 pieces of silver. So the price of a slave was 30 pieces of silver. Judas had planned to identify Jesus with a kiss. Typically in scripture, a kiss was a friendly gesture of greeting or departure. But here it was an enemy's gesture of betrayal. It would have been dark that night, and Judas wanted to make sure the authorities knew exactly who Jesus was. Now remember, Judas would have known where Jesus would be that night, as praying in this location was a usual custom of Jesus. This knowledge of Jesus' pattern 
and the note that Jesus was one of the twelve only heightens the horror of this moment. Judas' intent on sealing it with a kiss makes it all the more bitter. As Judas approached, Jesus the Savior said, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Jesus used the term, the term Son of Man. It is used over 80 times in the gospel accounts alone. This designation is often equated with the title Messiah. Uh, and it is used in Daniel chapter 7 to describe an apocalyptic figure from heaven that establishes an eternal kingdom and exercises dominion over all people. Judas was betraying the Messiah, the one from heaven who would soon establish his eternal kingdom and rule over all. The disciples were provoked into a defensive stance by this mob. They asked with a tone of affirmation, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? They didn't wait for an answer. Peter took action. Luke doesn't tell us who, but one of them, Peter, struck the servant of the high priest, and his name is Malchus, and cut off his right ear. Now, it was not uncommon to carry weapons. In fact, Jesus had just made a statement to the mob about swords uh, and clubs. The disciples were on alert. They were ready to guard and to defend Jesus. Jesus rebuked the disciples by saying, No more of this. He did not want or need his disciples to defend him with physical force. More importantly, he did not want to hinder what must take place. Jesus then healed the servant's ear. This may be somewhat surprising unless the reader takes into account why Jesus came, his earthly ministry in total, which often included healing. The healing of Malchus' ear was a sign of compassion toward those who had come to take him prisoner. Jesus had compassion toward his enemies. Now, in the gospel accounts, Jesus' healings demonstrated his power to reverse the effects of sin in this world and to overcome the power of evil. The disciples were ready to kill somebody for whom Jesus was ready to give his life. Now, Luke identified the authorities as the chief priests, officers of the temple, elders, the religious leaders, military and political leaders had gathered together to arrest Jesus. The powers of the world, in this case, came to take on the Son of Man. Jesus rebuked the mob for treating him as though he were a robber. Why did they need so many authorities? Why did they need weapons? I want you to note how Jesus also said, This is your hour, talking to the mob. In doing so, Jesus aligned the mob's actions with Satan, the evil one, and his power of darkness. Darkness would have its brief hour, but the light of the resurrection will shine for all of eternity. In this brief but tragic moment, God allowed the forces of evil to accomplish their will in order for God to accomplish His good. This whole account reads somberly like the dark night it was, but this darkness would soon pass. Now in closing, I'd like to give us some application 
uh, of this lesson that we can uh, think about and apply to our lives in the coming coming days. Believers should willingly submit to God's plans. Believers can stand in confidence when following God's will. And thirdly, believers can submit to God's will even in the face of rejection. Have a great week. Let's pray. Almighty God, Father of all, Creator of all, once again we thank you for sending your Son to fulfill your plan of redemption of sinful man who could not redeem himself in your presence. Father, forgive us our sin. Bless us now as we live the following week for you and your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen.